My name is Francine Michaels, and this is The Right Frequency. Is what you believe worth dying for? Perhaps that depends on what you believe and why you believe it. Is it because someone told you to believe something? Or is it because of something you experienced yourself? Is it of any consequence who it was that told you that you should or should not believe something? And what they would do if you did or did not agree? Did it matter or does it matter if they have authority over you? I'm asking you to suspend your disbelief for just the time of this broadcast and go back 400 years. Imagine trying to hold on to the mast of a ship during a treacherous storm in which the winds blew so mightily that you were thrown overboard into the sea. Then imagine holding on to a trailing rope while, with desperation, men tried to pull you back on board to safety. Some of these men aboard the ship that rescued you have been imprisoned because they were considered dangerous renegades, a threat to their nation. Many, if not all of them, had experienced sadistic, tyrannical dictators that thought nothing of mercilessly torturing their victims before they killed them. The men aboard this ship left everything like you did without even the certainty of making it to their destination alive. What were their crimes that they became such a threat? They dared to read the Bible for themselves and gather with one another to pray and study. They knew the government leaders were corrupt. They knew the religious leaders were corrupt. More than that, they knew that God was beckoning them to a place to worship him the way they believed they were called to, and they would be an example to the world. It was the year 1620, when the journey of those on the Mayflower resulted in the ultimate birth of a nation founded on religious freedom, the United States of America. Many of the men on board the ship had not brought their wives because they feared they would not survive, and in fact, many did not. Of the 18 women that boarded the ship, only five lived. Everyone on board knew the risk they were taking, but they were willing to take that risk because they believed in the Bible and they were willing to risk their lives to do what they believed God was telling them to do in his word. They were not willing to compromise their faith to the point of death. How far has the United States come from that point? In the documentary Monumental, Kirk Cameron presented the heartwarming history of how pilgrims came to the land of Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. In order to present the story, he traveled to Europe to meet those in historic places from which the pilgrims came in order to grasp the magnitude of the challenges they faced. Anyone that watches closely can see the men and women that came over from the Mayflower were not simply fleeing a corrupt government. They were being obedient to what God was telling them to do. Cameron explains that the pilgrims read the Geneva Bible, and it was the first time that average people had the opportunity to read the Bible for themselves in England, because it was the first time the Bible was affordable and accessible. Those few individuals who took the Bible as the word of God ultimately changed the course of human civilization. Up until the 14th century, only those educated in Latin were able to read scripture because it was controlled by the Catholic Church, 
who insisted that scripture remained written only in Latin. It was only when a man named John Wycliffe attempted the first English translation of the Bible that this was changed. Having been educated in Latin at the University of Oxford, Wycliffe recognized inconsistencies in what the Bible said and what the church taught. Wycliffe confronted the church, which resulted in him being arrested and accused of heresy. The pressure on Wycliffe must have been beyond anyone's imagination. Hundreds of years of control of the Catholic Church over what could and could not be spoken as truth was suddenly questioned. Before the church could martyr him, however, he died of a stroke. That wasn't good enough for the Catholic Church. His influence had already spread. They wanted that stopped. So to further intimidate people not to follow in his footsteps, disinterred and burned. Clearly, they wanted everyone to believe that Wycliffe was a heretic. The Catholic hierarchy insisted upon people believing only what they were told to believe. If individuals read the Bible for themselves, they would see what Wycliffe said was true, but only if they could read Latin. The church was not consistent with what the Bible said. Any further attempts from anyone to follow in Wycliffe's footsteps could result in them being killed. William Tyndale, many years later, a theologian and scholar, wanted to follow in Wycliffe's footsteps. And he heard about the greatest possibilities of sharing the Bible with the common man through the emergence of the printing press. He fled persecution in England for translating the Bible and went to Germany, which was already forging a path away from the Catholic Church with reformer Martin Luther. When Tyndale began printing in Cologne, Germany, officials came after him and he fled to preserve his life and the work he had done. He risked his life again and again, doing what undoubtedly he felt commissioned by God to do, with helpers along the way. German humanist Johannes Cochleus, a controversial man at the time of the Protestant Reformation, believed that Bible translations for everyone to read were evil. He was one of the men that wanted Tyndall stopped at all costs. He wrote, The New Testament translated into the vernacular is the food of death the fuel of sin, the veil of malice, the pretext of false liberty, the protection of disobedience, the corruption of discipline, the depravity of morals, the termination of concord, the death of honesty, the wellspring of vices, the instigation of rebellion, the milk of pride, the nourishment of contempt, the death of peace, the destruction of charity, the enemy of unity, the murderer of truth." Unquote. Tyndale stood his ground, however, in faith, knowing that all should have access to the word of God, so not to be misled by those who claimed to know the truth, but were leading people astray. He studied the word of God and risked his life to bring the truth of what the Bible said to those to whom it had been forbidden. He believed that it was the Bible that would confound and confront those that were in contempt of God. He knew in his heart and in his spirit that it was the Bible only that would unveil governmental and ecclesiastical corruption. Dozens of people were killed for even owning one of Tyndall's Bibles. His holy boldness even allowed him to confront King Henry VIII on his marriage to Anne Boleyn, which likely added fuel to the fire for the king to persecute him. 
more important than his life, however, was the soul of the King of England. For his last words were said to have been a prayer, quote, for the eyes of the king to be opened. Those prayers for the king's soul were apparently heard because one year after his death, King Henry VIII allowed for the first English translation of the Bible, much of which had already been completed by Tyndale. This reprieve from authoritarian dictatorship, however, did not last. His daughter, Queen Mary of England, took over the persecution where King Henry had left off, trying to revert England back to Catholicism. She ruled between 1553 and 1557. Nicknamed Bloody Mary, she executed 287 people to intimidate those that wanted to follow in the Protestant Reformation against the Catholic Church. Intimidation, domination, manipulation. These were the things that the Bible exposed. God's word, however, had already been outside the walls of the church. And once that happened, the restraint that the Catholic Church once held was no longer as strong. Protestant scholars continued to work on an English version of the Bible that was easy for the average person to read. It had extensive notes in the margins. It was developed under the general direction of Miles Coverdale, John Knox, with the influence of John Calvin. It was so easy to read, so easy for people to understand what God meant in his word, that people were able to experience God's word without dictatorial interference of the false teachers. It was also the first Bible to use chapters and verses serving as reference points. It was so effective in exposing corruption it was so effective, ultimately, in helping people to understand the limitations of governmental authority that King James I was afraid that it would encourage others to question or usurp his authority. To prevent this from happening, he would only allow his authorized King James Version, which left out the study notes. The authorized King James Version, which so many people believe is the only version they could ever use that was accurate. That was exactly what King James wanted. The Geneva Bible, with its extensive, helpful notes, gained such popularity that the Bible became the center of families and communities. It not only transformed people, it transformed the world. People were finally free from the intimidation and manipulation of rulers using the word of God. People could, for the first time in centuries, begin to discern what God was saying personally. As a result of reading the Bible, many recognized how wicked their spiritual and secular rulers were, just as the leaders had feared. Those that knew the truth, however, could not simply accept the status quo any longer. It so vexed their spirit that they could no longer live in tolerance of the lies and corruption. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. ESV as a result of this discernment and strong conviction, there were some that decided to separate themselves from those that wanted to remain in the status quo. Thus, the name separatist was coined, rebels by society standards. In other words, this group believed that they should be self-governing. 
having the indwelling spirit as their conscience. They believe they should have little difficulty judging affairs among themselves with righteousness. From, from Britannica.com, quote, a fundamental belief of the separatists was the idea of the gathered church founded by the Holy Spirit, not man or the state. Believing that true Christian believers should seek out other Christians and together form their churches, separatists emphasized the right and responsibility of each congregation to determine its affairs without having to submit those decisions to the judgment of a higher human authority. That notion stood in contrast to the territorial basis of the Church of England, in which everyone in a certain area was assigned to a parish church, and each local parish submitted to the oversight of a larger church hierarchy. Unquote. Compare this to 1 Samuel chapter 8 of the Bible in which the people of Israel asked Samuel to appoint them a king so that they could just be like everyone else. In contrast with the Israelites, these separatists did not want to be like everyone else. Instead, they wanted God to be their ruler and believed that he would lead them through his word. These separatists could see the corruption because their eyes were not blinded as the result of their sins. The word of God had washed them. It also allowed them to have the tenacity not to conform to their unholy dictates. They recognized if they remained, just like the Pharisees did to the early Christians, they too would be persecuted, possibly even to their death. Civil authorities had difficulty with the separatist beliefs because they didn't go along with what everyone else was doing. They could not be manipulated, nor could they be intimidated. They knew what was true and what was false, who was corrupt and who was righteous. Before heading to the new world, Initially, a group of these separatists went to Holland to escape persecution, only to find a similar trend of persecution developing there. There was something unusual about this group that made them distinctly different from other religious reformers. They were determined to meet, even in secret if need be, to pray and to read and to seek out the meaning of the word of God among themselves, using it as a compass as to where they should go and what they should do. They studied the Bible and prayed as though their life depended upon it, and they were insistent upon the lack of governmental interference. William Bradford, a spiritual leader that came over on the Mayflower, clearly had the mission to follow Christ wherever he might lead early in his life. From Reberg.com, quote, the young orphan William Bradford joined the separatist at age 15, was harassed by his own family who threatened to disown him if he continued his association with separatists. To them he calmly replied, to keep a good conscience and walk in such a way as God had prescribed in his word is the thing which I must prefer before you all and above life itself. Wherefore, since it is for a good cause that I am likely to suffer the disasters which you lay before me, you have no cause either to be angry with me or sorry for me. Yea, I am not only willing to part with everything that is dear to me in this world for this cause, but I am thankful that God hath given me the heart to do so and will accept me to suffer for him." Unquote. The men and women that traversed the seas with Bradford went with chances of survival next to none. The choice of a ship, absurd at best, it wasn't designed for that kind of voyage. They didn't even seem to pick the right season for the trip. There was tremendous disease and discomfort aboard the ship. Their efforts to obey God at all costs, however, were not missed by the author of the book for which they risked their lives. The written word had power, and so when they made their move to travel, they did so with the belief 
that they must have a printing press themselves when they arrived at the New World. One might think that that was not the most important thing, but to them the Word of God was the most important thing. It was a harrowing voyage. Seasickness abounded, and the stench of that alone must have been nearly unbearable. Those that chose to come had made a choice to accept this suffering, even death, if they did not survive. But in the midst of all of this, they were confronted with a storm which could have destroyed them all, except they had one item that they insisted upon bringing with them to the new world. Their printing press, screw. They needed a massive screw for that printing press. Their dedication to share the word of God with others when they arrived literally saved their lives. That screw, due to its unusual size, was able to secure the mast, which ultimately resulted in them surviving that storm. The giant screw was just the right size to steady the ship. They knew the power of the written word to transform the world. They never could have known the result of having that one screw would so impact the course of history for an entirely different reason than the one they had thought. The God of miracles, which they followed to the new world, gave them a miracle while aboard the ship to sustain them physically and spiritually as they were obedient to obey his voice and his leading to the new world. The separatists didn't trust men. They put no one above God. They trusted his word and they sought to do his will, believing that they were to go just as Abraham was told to go because they were led to by his word. They trusted him to the point of death because they knew they knew their sacrifice would reap rewards for future generations. The challenges they would face in the new world were not quite the same ones that they faced in England. Those that separated themselves for righteousness sake did not realize that those with whom they tried to separate would follow them claiming to come for the same reason, falsely. Nor would they recognize the consequences it would have for future generations. For those that think the Bible is just a book, could a book do all that? Please like, please share, please follow, and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.